Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a Maddox 2021 webinar series. Uh, today we have Kathleen Almy and Kelly Spoon with Authentic and Alternative Assessments for the Intro Stats course. Uh, this webinar is jointly sponsored by AMATIC and the ASA. Uh, views expressed by the presenters are not necessarily the views of AMATIC and any commercial products mentioned are not necessarily endorsed by AMATIC. Uh, McGraw-Hill is the sponsor for the 2021 AMATIC webinar series. Um, if you are not a member of AMATIC but would like to consider, we would love to have you. Um, you can join at amatic.org. We have our Facebook site, uh, plenty of upcoming professional development opportunities, including our, as of right now, live conference in Phoenix in October, and then next fall in Toronto. Uh, there are other webinars and traveling workshop opportunities. Um, and the results of this webinar and all can be found at amatic.org. Um, Hopefully the materials from today's webinar will be sent out to all registered people later today. Okay, with that being said, I will turn it over to our presenters. All right, Kathleen, introduce yourself. Your name all is right. first. Hi all, I'm Kathy Almy, um, and I'll let Kelly introduce herself, but um, my, I was math faculty for 20 years. I now run my own business, and but I still teach uh, part time, and I will be teaching stats this fall. It is my favorite course to teach. Kelly, uh, I'm Kelly Spoon. I teach at San Diego Mesa College, uh, not to be confused with Mesa in Arizona. Um, and yeah, I teach stats in like every modality you could imagine. So a ton of different stats classes. I also teach AP stats at a high school here in San Diego. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I'm in Illinois, so. Not that anybody's wanting to be in Illinois today, but if you are, rock on. Okay, so uh, Kelly, are we doing our, did you want to start with our poll or the chat blast? Oh, the poll. Yes. Thank you. I forgot. Good thing I told people the plans. Pat, poll us. Oh, wrong poll, Pat. I just figured it would be nice to get to know, see people. I think that's the one thing that's been asked in every uh, like professional learning setting that I've been in recently is, are you back on campus in the fall? Um, I don't I think I can see how quickly this is going. Huh. Okay, so most people are back in person. Um, if you chose other, you can also put in the chat what, what that means, because I'm curious if you are stuck doing the both at the same time. Um, all right, so Kathy. Uh, I was muted, thank you all. Sorry, my dog was barking. I didn't wanna to torture you all with her silliness. Uh, so one thing I forgot to mention was our goal for today. So what we're trying to do is help you if you want to incorporate authentic or alternative assessment at the comfort level you have and the time that you have for this fall. So we're gonna give you a variety of different ideas and levels. So like you just wanna put your toe in the water or if you wanna jump all in, there's something for everyone. Um, also, as you have questions, just throw them in the chat and we'll just do questions as we go. What's nice is um, Kelly and I are alternating back and forth so we can each be watching the chat for each other and um, we're gonna keep this casual. All right, so uh, can you go ahead and animate the question. All right, so we wanna hear from you. So type in the chat, but do not press enter. Um, we wanna hear from you, what is the purpose of assessment to you? What do you, what is the person, I can speak. What is the purpose of assessment? So just type, don't press enter. We'll uh, get your answers in just a sec. Ah, 
oh, wait, wait, wait. We're gonna, we'll do it in just a second. You guys are always jumping the gun. Everyone does this, by the way, Every, so it's okay. All right, let's go. Go ahead and hit enter. Here they come, the waterfall, as Kelly called it. Ooh, I like to let you know what students have understood and where do we need to make changes? That's great. Love that. Make, understand where they understand and then we react. Measure student understanding. Okay. Um, All right, I, I love these thoughts. There's a lot about feedback, a lot about motivation, uh, nothing really about assigning a letter grade at the end of the course, although we all are all tasked with that as part of um, teaching. But we thought we'd start off today with the typical assessment um, that most people are using in math and stats courses, which is traditional exams. So sort of most of us use them uh, and how can we make them better and I think we've been forced to do that a little bit as a result of the last year and a half, uh, our students being online and having to rethink things as maybe open book or open internet. Um, but let's let's dive a little deeper into this. So here's a traditional question that I have seen on many a colleague's exam. Uh, calculate the standard deviation for a given data set. So the question I have um, for everyone in the chat is, what is the goal? If you saw this on a colleague's exam or you put this on your own exam in the past, what is the purpose of this question? What are, what are you assessing with this question? All right, Tyler says a skill check. Yes, and I, I intentionally left this vague in terms of whether it was with technology or without. Um, so I, I like that so many people are thinking about either technology or, I mean, being able to use a formula, a complex formula with the summation is, is a skill. Um, but there's also a lot of people who seem very skeptical about this question and are writing in things like calculations, lower level thinking, not understanding. Um, and so I then task you with, thank you so much, Stephen. It was as if you were an audience plant. Um, if the goal was actually understanding standard deviation and what it measures, what would a better question be? So um, I know that this is a large task to ask of you. So I'm gonna give you three minutes. It's gonna be awkward because it'll be silent. I'm sure this will be great for the recording, but three minutes to type into the chat uh, what a better question might be to under see if a student understands standard deviation. And we will be sharing the chat later because there's gonna be, I can already tell tons of great tips and ideas in here. So no worries if you see something and you didn't have a chance to write it down. I'm going to scrap the entire talk and then just ask the people to do this in the chat for everything I want good questions for. I'm not. I'm done. These are great. All right, will anybody be mad if I stop the three minutes early? I didn't know how long this would take, but everybody was very succinct in coming up with really excellent ideas. 
Oh, I love it. All right, if you have ideas, keep throwing them in the chat. I'll move on to some possible improvements, some of which match what people have put in there. Some of the things that were shared, like Stephanie's idea of really like the purpose of standard deviation, which would you want? Same with Margaret's. It, I, I'm stealing those and using them, so thank you. Um, but here were some of the ideas that I, oh no, I came up with. Um, one, I just, uh, I just did a reading group on grading for equity as part of US COTS. And one suggestion that Feldman has um, for dealing with some issues with grading is the idea that zeros really impact measures of center, right? Having that low outlier can, can destroy a student's grade. Um, and so a suggestion that's made is to change all of those minimum scores, those zeros to a 50. And so um, here I have a question just says, how would making the, that change impact the standard deviation to the right? So a lot of questions here about like, oh, something was an error. How will making this change and, and correcting that influence my measure of uh, standard deviation? Um, I'm gonna have to read Glenn's now, I'm seeing that in the chat. Uh, another one that I saw multiple times was this idea of giving them some displays of data and asking them to either order them or tell which one had the smallest or largest standard deviation. So this particular example uh, was from Roxy Peck's uh, guest post on Alan Rossman's blog. Um, and then this one, similar to Stephanie's, but different. Um, I thought, I actually thought this was gonna be where she was going, um, which would be larger, the standard deviation of a thousand randomly selected people or the standard deviation of 10 randomly selected cats? Uh, and this is Alan Rossman's question. And I love this question because, well, this would be a hard test question, I think, for students. I, I worry sometimes that once we make our test questions so higher on the Bloom's taxonomy level of understanding that we're making them almost inequitable in some ways. Um, this would be a great discussion question because I could see having students take a side of a debate uh, and argue for each because, right, we divide by n minus one. So clearly, of course, the humans would have a smaller standard deviation than the cats. But then if you think about the relative range of those weights, now there's another argument for the other side. And this could be a really rich discussion for students. Um, where there's good understanding on both sides of it. Um, so some tips and tricks as you rethink traditional assessments, not that I think, judging by the chat, many of us need these, uh, but really reflect on what is being assessed. I think sometimes there's a disconnect between the skill that we're trying to assess. If it's understanding standard deviation, asking students to compute standard deviation isn't really addressing that. Um, and then another one that came up just as Kathy and I were chatting, but like making this presentation was breaking up questions whenever possible. So um, if there was a required step in part A that you need for part B, uh, taking and breaking those into two separate questions. So don't have students necessarily calculate the line, the regression line, least squares regression line, and then do a prediction, make those two separate questions so that you're not accidentally assessing, you know, one skill uh, when you're trying to assess two. And then Kathy, did you want to talk about the... Yeah. And then um, does it, uh, to answer Margaret's question, yes, the we will have the slides available. And this is all Kelly. She has a beautiful design eye. And so kudos to her for making them look so awesome. Um, one thing I want you to, to think about is, do you want to use multiple choice and free response? And of course, this is always gets an animated um, discussion amongst faculty. Um, you can have really challenging and thoughtful multiple choice questions, but they are hard to write. So there's a trade off. Um, free response is much simpler to write, but it takes longer to grade. Multiple choice, harder to write, really good ones, really quick to grade, obviously. Um, but something if you already have some multiple choice tests, because I do use some multiple choice, I'm going to admit, and they are not easy. Um, not that you know, we're trying to be super difficult, but I do, I, I do want my, I'm trying to challenge them to think. Um, but when we've got a tip here, and I love this, is you could have them um, create a question where you already give them the answers and say where this response would be the correct answer. So, you know, it's like, here's the answer. You come up with the question. And there, another option is, can you come up with the misconception that led to this particular answer choice? Now, granted, these, again, are not quick to, to grade. These would be also great for a class discussion, but um, they're outstanding for, you know, getting students thinking. And, and one thing I like about these is we did promise to give you ways to save time in our, our little abstract, right? Um, I think that using 
previous multiple choice questions and then using this as a way to rewrite them um, is just a way to like, I'm not reinventing anything, right? Coming up with something from scratch can be a lot of work, but if I have an existing multiple choice, mm -hmm. all I have to do is say, okay, here was the multiple choice from last year's exam. How could I edit this so that B is now the correct answer? Um, so I was just thinking of this as, was another thing from Joe Feldman's book about reassessments and then using multiple choice, but then asking them harder questions sort of as a, as a reassessment idea. So um, what can we do other than exams? So this is where I'm gonna have uh, Pat throw our second poll up, mm -hmm. which is this. Um, basically, where do you get data for your students to use? So the poll is the exact same thing. There it is. All right. Okay, this is interesting. Got all kinds of results. Okay, so we're gonna look at in, in this, this part of the presentation, um, where we've looked at you know, traditional tests and some things that you can do with them and how you can, you, know, you can look at problems, you can rewrite them. Oh, one thing that we forgot totally, and it's funny because I know we had this in our abstract, so. I apologize, we forgot this. Um, one of the things that we were also thinking about when you're rewriting test questions is we do know that students have lots available to them to look up things. So if you write richer questions, if you ask students, you know, create a question that does this or create a data set that does that, or, you know, however, if you rewrite your questions for more depth of understanding, they are much harder to Google the answers or put them in Chegg or cheat or whatever. I find stats is one of the easiest courses to write questions so that students uh, cannot cheat that easily as long as we um, up the difficulty level or the expectations, I guess, on Bloom's taxonomy of what we want to hear from students or find out about students. Okay, so in this section, we're gonna start looking at some other things that you can do with classes um, and some, some other kinds of our, um, assessments that you can do. And so one of the things that I do, and I've got a giant list as I, as I plan my semester of all the things I've got to do, this is on the list. I've got to go in, I've got to take my previous uh, class survey. I usually, you know, I'm like, oh, or any of these, like I used to have questions like, how many songs do you have on your MP3? No one has that anymore. So, I mean, I might as well have asked them, do they have a record player? Um, so, you know, I ask, I update it based on, you know, like I'll probably have something in there about TikTok instead of just Snapchat this time on like what social media platform do they prefer using, whatever. But every semester I ask my students to fill out a survey. And back in the day, I did this by hand and actually like typed up responses. Ugh. Um, you do not need to do that. So I'm curious if you do this, what are some of the questions that you like to ask your students? Um, and you, know, you can see other, you can search online depending on what platform you're using. You can see other um, professors surveys like I know um, Mike Sullivan is here today. I know that sometimes he, or not sometimes, I know he does, he shares his surveys. So if you want to see a sample beginning of the semester survey, he shares his. But what kinds of questions do you ask your students? Okay. Oh, you weigh their book bag. Oh, that's, oh, I want to do that. Oh my gosh, one time we had a professor who does not work at our school anymore who weighed students. He would take them out in the hall and weigh them and then use that data set. And we had to kindly explain to him, don't do that. Like, Oh, I love Cheryl's uh, addition here, that pulse rate, because it needs to be cleaned up. I actually have a couple in my survey, like that major question. I have favorite social media also. And I have to label them messy and like don't use because I, I want to show them data cleaning. Even yeah. that height, students are notoriously terrible at converting their height to inches. And so there's always some, you know, 40 inch student in my class who's a, an outlier. Exactly. Or a five inch student. 
because yeah. aren't they all? Um, all right, so looking at that. So we have our, um, it's, so keep in mind again, when you're doing, if you're doing these surveys, if you've never done it before, give it a shot. And this doesn't have to be anything that's arduous and it's awesome because it provides you this rich, real data set. And I'm gonna give you this tip later, but one of the things you can do is if you continue to use some of the questions over and over again, you could have a data set that's just this semester, but you could have an ongoing pool of data that you add to over time, which I love to do that. Um, but if you're doing these kinds of surveys, your LMS, um, whatever, if you have like a homework system, a lot of times they have a survey um, way, uh, method you can use or just use a Google form. But try to get that data into some kind of spreadsheet or some way that um, on a scale of one to 10, how smart are you? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, we have different ways that we can get this kind of data. Now, the reason I ask for this is because I share this in my classes, LMS, I remove. So let's talk about cleaning data. I don't clean the data for the same reason like what Kelly was saying right off the bat. I want them to see that depending on how you ask questions, what you actually get, which can be, you know, not great. Um, but they need to see what data really looks like. And then you learn how to better write your questions and they get to, they get to see that experience. But what I do is I anonymize the data. I remove all their names. And then I make this as a data set that's available to our class. And we use it probably once a week where we just, we go back to it all the time because it's so rich and it gives us so many things that we can do. Okay, so um, the next slide, we're looking at some of the things that I like to do are activities, and I bet a lot of you do activities um, like this. For a long time, I just did, you know, interesting little things that were just, oh, this is a great way to increase engagement and get students talking, but you can actually use these for assessment. You can use them for formative or summative or both, however you want. You can make them low stakes. It doesn't have to be highly punitive, but there are so many great activities that exist. Like there's no need to invent anything. I mean, feel free, but if you, you know, there's so many free things on the um, internet that are awesome that you can use with your classes. So like one that I have used forever is um, when we start probability, I always have students um, flip a coin and have them write down how many heads they got, how many tails they got. And then we, we collect, we have their individual data, then we have the class data. Then I, um, again, put that with data that I've done for years and years and years. And it leads into this great discussion and I can develop the law of large numbers, which is awesome, okay? Um, now, do I know that there is an applet that does this? Yes, I get that. But one of the things I will say, and this was, we have this somewhere um, further down the line, but I'll just go ahead and mention it. When you're thinking about doing activities with students, it's good to do physical things with them, not just go straight to, um, I agree, David, hands-on beats simulation. They don't always see what's happening with simulations and it's really easy to go too fast. And they're just, they don't know what's really going on. So I, I use a ton of applets and simulations in my class but I usually start with physical first. And then we move to that over time as we go, as we go from concrete to abstract. So um, I did not invent, invent this, but one of my absolute favorite things to do, if you've never done this, this is so fun. When I'm developing the binomial distribution, I pass out in my class, and I did this last fall, I just did it online, but I pass out a quiz that has um, three questions and there's no questions. It just says one, two, three, and there's answers A, B, C, D, E. And I tell them, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I didn't have time to write the quiz. So I just need you guys to randomly pick the answers. What do you think is right? And of course they look at me like, what is she smoking? But what we do is what we're looking at is what is the, um, just randomly, what's the chance of getting, how many questions would you get right on a three question quiz? And it allows us to do a lot with binomial probabilities. And again, I can take their data and I can add it to previous semesters. And we have another example of law of large numbers, which is really, really cool. Um, so you can introduce a topic with weekly activities. You can develop understanding and there's all kinds of activities we can do that, whether you collect data from your class in some way and do some kind of correlation or regression. Um, the M&Ms, I think there was a whole stats book written on using M&Ms to teach stats, it might be AP stats. There's so many things you can do with it um, to do, uh, confidence intervals. And again, there's applets to do this as well, but it's fun to do it physically. Okay, so um, if you go to the next slide, um, I guess we talked about this. When you're thinking about assessment, maybe some of those you assess, maybe some of them you don't. Um, one thing that I'm gonna push myself to do this fall is I have all these 
activities and um, I have more activities than I will ever be able to teach in my lifetime. Um, and I always feel like I'm cramming to try to get them in with, um, to get them in with assessments and other things that we're doing. And what I'm going to do is give more time to them in class and also have them write more about them and analyze the data that we get in these different activities we do for some kind of grade. We're gonna do that. And I'm going to pull back on the amount of in-class testing I do. I'm still gonna test, but I'm gonna change things around this fall. It's an experiment. We shall see what happens. But I realize if my goal is students really making sense of data, then I need more time on making sense of data and I need to give more points to that um, and ask them to do more with it. And I wanna pull back a little bit on um, the testing in class so that we have more time to do it. Okay, so we talked about this, start with physical, move to online, keep data and the law of large numbers. All right, moving to Kelly. All right, and while we're talking about like formative versus summative assessment, um, just something that has been on my mind ever since I read it um, from that Grading for Equity book was this idea that where a student is in the learning uh, progression defines whether something is summative or formative. It's not on us as instructors to say, here are the formative things to help you learn, and here's the one summative moment to figure out if you actually know it. Um, I'm not there, but it's just something that's like in my brain and in the back of it as I'm thinking um, about how my, my class is run. Um, but some other for formative assessments that I do in my class. Uh, one, I do discussion boards that are my data analysis projects. Uh, these are all ways to lead up and um, really scaffold the project my students do at the end of the semester. So this is an example of one uh, from our class survey data. They get to choose any categorical variable they want, create a display and then comment. And I give them some um, options here. Uh, is anything surprising? Is it not what you expected for our class? Um, and then they do the same thing with a quantitative variable, starting with descriptives and then predicting whether the data will be left or right skewed when they make the histogram or, or symmetric based on those measures of center. Uh, and they have to tie the measures of center to their prediction um, and then posting a histogram and describing the shape in context. And you know, I grade this with a rubric. Uh, one thing I will say that has been key for all of my discussion boards if, if assignments are formative, I'm allowing my students unlimited revisions. So I'm, I'm giving them feedback, telling them where they're not meeting the mark, and then having them, them revise and resubmit. Um, the project is slightly more summative in that way. Uh, the other thing that I thought of in terms of an alternative assessment technique, and this is one that I'm still developing and thinking about how to do, um, is renewable assignments. Uh, Margaret had a great question in the chat about what students use for graphics. I like Canva if they're going to make graphics. It's not great for statistical graphics. So there I use StatCrunch just because it's real easy and only $13. Um, but there are lots of easy data analysis things. Um, but renewable assignments are usually things where students are making something that's valuable to the community after their class. Uh, most of the assignments, I would say all of the assignments in my class are kind of like one and done throwaways. Right, like they create a discussion board, they never look at it again after they, they revise and resubmit it up to perfect. They take a test and that's, that's that. Um, but having them create things, uh, as Kathy said, it is very difficult to write a good multiple choice question. So having them create multiple choice questions for future classes, maybe a Quizlet that they can use to study. Um, having them create some video explanations or come up with an example um, from you know, real life. Those are all things that they can make that then you can use for going forward, saving you some time and also allowing them to feel like they did something that has more impact beyond, you know, just getting a letter grade. So still coming up with ideas for this. This is where I 100% um, at the end of this, we'll, we'll provide you with a Google Doc where we can continue to share these excellent ideas. And um, I'm hoping that all of you will give me just as many great ideas as you did for how to test standard deviation understanding. So that leads us to authentic assessments. And I think those last two can also be considered authentic. Um, I actually Googled this because to me, authentic was really about tying things to students' lives. And most of the definitions of authentic were tying them to the real world, whether it was something impacted by their lives or how they might use statistics. And so I do think how they would use statistics and impacting real, the real world 
both data analysis projects and renewable assignments fit that bill. Um, but one way that I do this in my classes in terms of tying it to students' lives is again with discussion boards. So about half of my discussion boards are strictly data analysis, having students look at our survey data and prepare themselves for our project. Uh, and then the other half are really trying to get students to see the connection between what we're doing and what they may do in the future or what they're doing right now in their lives. So here's one example of uh, one of those discussion boards from my class. There are two pieces. One is connecting statistics to what they're interested in. So they have to talk about what field they're going into and why they're interested in it. And then of course, tying it to my outcomes in my course. So in this case, this is about data collection and correctly identifying types of variables as well as observational studies versus experiments. So I asked students to come up with four variables that might be collected as part of their field of study um, and then correctly categorize them as just numeric or categorical. And then again, uh, this extra piece of observational study versus experiment for how that data would be collected. Uh, and these are not the best grade, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, with a rubric, it's not as bad. There are four variables, they're correctly identified. Um, they've, they've correctly identified where data would come from and given a justification. Uh, but again, that revision process is, is very important. So um, if I allow revisions, I, I make this useful by having a rubric. It makes it reasonable for me. Um, I just continue going back to my rubric and I can see, oh, the only thing the student missed was whether or not this would be an experiment or observational study. And I set up my discussion boards in Canvas so that students cannot um, edit their original response. They have to do a reply. Uh, it lets me see the learning progression, lets them see the learning progression, and also makes it a lot easier for me to reassess uh, whether or not they've, they've met the mark for those outcomes. Um, and then some ideas from Small Teaching Online, which is another US COTS reading group. Uh, thank you, Megan. Uh, ditching the two responses, this wasn't explicitly from that, but as a participant in a lot of things that require discussion boards, uh, those two responses were always annoying. Um, one, if you posted early, you had to come back and then somehow re-engage in the conversation. Um, and then grading them and doing them, they always seemed perfunctory, right? It was just, uh, I agree, that's a good point, Kathy. Uh, you did good. I tried to make them better by giving students suggested ways to respond that were more meaningful, you know, post another display of the data and explain how it shows something different than the original that, that Kathy posted or, or whoever you're responding to posted. Um, but one of the ideas in Small Teaching Online was we're trying to use discussion boards if we're using them to replicate a conversation. And no conversation is just you throwing your ideas into the void and then responding to two separate pieces to two separate people. So I've gotten rid of the two responses. And I think I might, especially for those questions that are more uh, related to their field, have students just contribute something meaningful to the conversation and give them options, whether they respond to someone or post their original. So Margaret, I don't, I don't require two responses to colleagues in my discussion boards. For those data analysis ones, um, I give them options if they want to. Um, but they're not part of the grade, they're not required. Um, and then I'm thinking about just having a meaningful contribution as opposed to a primary and response um, for those more, how is stats related to your field? And yes, I'm with Jennifer, Give, giving them starting places to start for those, it definitely helps if you want it, require responses or have them as part of the process. Um, another thing is if you're gonna do those data analysis part, uh, discussions, letting students choose which group they're going to be a part of based on their data set or interest. So if you're using, if you have options for data sets instead of just using that class data set, let them choose which group they're in. Um, and then posting highlights of what students have done well, uh, especially those students who may uh, need that additional uh, confidence boost uh, in your like weekly um, recap. And then um, the other piece, and I posted a bunch of these resources later, is using the, the actual verbs of Bloom's taxonomy to level up your, your discussion questions. So instead of just a vague explain, 
make it a compare and contrast or analyze how does this connect to another thing. Um, so that's one of the other pieces that I've been working on with my discussions to try to make them a little stronger. And then the, the most authentic piece is bringing us all together into a student led project, right? This is how stats is done in real life. We answer questions. Um, and so I'm gonna give everyone a minute or two. Uh, what are some reasons that professors may not do projects in the class or um, some things that have maybe gone horribly awry when you've tried projects on your own? I'm gonna need people who wrote time to, ex to explain what they mean. Oh, I like that. So time consuming for you as a professor or for the students or like in terms of class time. Oh. We really like Audrey's concern. How do we know if they did it or somebody else did it? We asked an English professor the other day, like, how do you know if students wrote their own essays? Like, we don't. I like the messy data sets. Time for grading. I like Todd. We still haven't got statistical significance. Yeah. There's, there's no relationship between how many classes you have and how many things you lug around in your book bag. Oh, I like group dynamics, too complicated and messy. All right. So hopefully some of the things that I have trouble, I've, I've had all of these same concerns and I have definitely um, addressed many of them throughout um, my slow movement towards a semester long project. Um, so this is a quote from Small Teaching Online. Um, Many assignments that become the cumulative assessment. This to me is that scaffolding, um, setting deadlines, providing feedback for each, helping them pace themselves. So here's my overview for the semester long project that I run in my class. I do have students work in teams. I know groups are sometimes troublesome, um, but the only thing my students do as a team is create the survey and potentially they can do their final presentation together. But everything else, they're there to support each other. They're not having to do any of this collaboratively necessarily. Um, but that survey creation, for me, one of the hardest pieces was students ask garbage questions. I mean, they're questions, they just, they, they're not survey designers. Um, and so I really had to take the time to be like, I need you in groups so that I have enough time to consult with every group. And I, I need their, yeah, I need, I need you to also support each other in writing better questions. So my teams, I tell them four, um, but sometimes it ends up higher and I, that's okay. Um, when we were in person or when we were on Zoom, I let, rather when we were in person, I let students choose their own teams and then put team names up on the board and their theme. And if people were interested who were kind of memberlet, like teamless, they could choose. Uh, now I just have students either self-select based on an interest or I have them fill out a questionnaire saying, who would you wanna work with? Is there anyone you don't wanna work with? Is there, are there any topics that you really feel passionate about pursuing? And I do allow usually like there's one or two students who are like very interested in something that no one else is interested in and I will let them work on an independent project. But those tend to be my highest students um, who are like, I had a student last semester who was donor conceived and was very passionate about looking at some, you know, doing a survey of other people who were donor conceived. I think she was like one of like a hundred genetic siblings from like one donor. And so she had this giant network that she wanted to know more about. Um, yes, thank you, Pat. Thank you, Scott. Um, so the first piece is I had my students um, brainstorm together. This was in my synchronous class. Um, they were supposed to go to their slide and create 
uh, five questions, only requirements. One had to be quantitative, one had to be categorical. Um, and I did give them some feedback about issues I had seen before, so I didn't have to see them again. Making sure it was very specific in terms of timelines or, or timeframes for things, um, not making ranges. My students love to make overlapping ranges. How many hours a week do you work, zero to 10 or 10 to 20? And I'm like, what if I work 10? Which one of those do I choose? Um, and so I, I gave them some feedback of things to avoid. Don't give open-ended categorical questions because then you're gonna spend an hour data cleaning, uh, trying to categorize things. Um, and then those multiple selection questions are just never easy to deal with later. Um, the, the next piece is actually I took from a psychology uh, stats professor at Mesa. She did this differently. Um, but in order to get those surveys filled out, as long as their population was Mesa students, I gave students a Canvas quiz where they had to go fill out the survey. Um, and then uh, they had to basically answer these questions about the variable, like about this. What are, what are some interesting questions you could answer with this survey? Just to make sure they had opened it at least. The, my colleague who did this, she used this for the survey creation portion. She had students give each other feedback as part of this. Go look at theirs and then explain whether or not these questions are meeting the criteria for good survey questions because she had an entire section on survey design. Because of the time constraints, I didn't do survey design. I just acted as a consultant and told students if their questions were good and they were good to make a form. Every, student, every group had to correct, uh, put their form in uh, through... Uh, me before they could go collect data. Um, and then everything else again was was in groups, but here's where everything was individual. Um, each student had to choose a um, variable, make sure it was clean, write down any pro thing they did in part of the cleaning process. Um, they had to explore a relationship between two variables and all of this is graded individually. So a lot of those group dynamics weren't an issue, but all of this I did spend time in class for. So my class, the last 30 minutes to an hour every day was devoted to them to be able to work with their team on their individual pieces. And they really did support each other, both when we were on campus and when we were um, on Zoom. They would, I'd put them into breakout rooms and they would stay through the entire class time supporting each other. Uh, my classes are 16 week. I don't do a group project in my eight week. I have them do all of these things just individually with our, our data. And then again, they, they analyze the, the relationship um, with their options in terms of ANOVA, chi-squared, a two sample test, uh, correlation or regression. And so that all puts together the project. Each of these pieces I grade. Um, individually and I, I have deadlines. So the last four weeks of the semester, maybe six weeks of the semester are de dedicated to this. I grade everything and they can resubmit until it's perfect uh, to put together. Um, I have 46 students in a class. It's not as bad when they're in groups. Um, and so then yes, the last piece of this is they do a final submission, which can either be a video, a written report or an infographic. Because I've done all that other checks up till then, I'm, I, this is just putting it all together in a wrap, wrapped up pretty thing. So anyways, I know I went through those quickly, but the slides are there. And if you want to reach out or you have something else, like I said, uh, looks like we're getting a lot of stuff in the chat. And then there's this, I'll give you a space to share in just a second. Um, so I said all of this, uh, scaffold it. Having due dates makes this grading way less painful. Uh, makes the time feel like it's there. Um, even with revisions, this is not overwhelming for me to take care of at the end of the semester. I did replace my final exam with this. So I do not have a final exam in my stats class because at the end of the day, I'd rather they know how to analyze data than they can take a test. Um, and I really made sure all of the grades for the project are based on statistical understanding. Nothing is based on presentation skills or eye contact, and it's not based on an overall group grade. I, I do think those are all keys and they all come straight from that grading for equity book too. And I wanted to throw in, um, oh, yeah. I, so I've had some experience with the whole authentic grading thing. And actually I love Kelly's project and how she, she's actually got me um, open my mind back to being willing to do this because 
I've done things like this and I'm sure if you've ever done projects, they can be, you can have frustrating results. So one thing to, to keep in mind, like I actually did this with an agency that um, reached out to me. I don't even know how they knew we were teaching stats, but they were like, they, it was a group, it was a community organization that they were having um, lower attendance over time and they wanted to get a better sense of the things that um, people were liking that they were offering and that weren't. And so they wanted us to do this whole um, survey and, and, and provide this to the community and then analyze the data. Okay, so I think you can imagine the problem is we could not get a nice random sample because students just wanted to do a convenience sample. So I, you know, how good our results were, they weren't. Um, just because I was, you know, sheer laziness or, you know, whatever, it takes time. And that was one of the things that they learned about, like when you're collecting data, if you want to have good data, it takes time to get that. So um, that's why I would do this again. I wouldn't necessarily do it for um, an outside real group um, because of the, uh, how, off, you know, how reliable are the results related to that. We had um, on our campus, since you know, everybody and their brother on campuses teaches statistics. It's not just the math department. We had statistics on another part of our campus in a different discipline. And they had students do a project, collect data, and then present it. They were actually were able to present for one of the groups to the board. And one of it was about the students. They were very excited that they had um, surveyed students about online offerings and whether or not that we should have them or whatever. And basically the outcome was um, we didn't really need to have online and we really didn't need to have um, evening sections, um, basically, you know, face-to-face -face day sections or where it's at. I think you can imagine the problem here. They were only talking to other students in face-to-face -face day classes. So the problem is, is that they weren't stopped before, no one qualified that before it went to the board. And there were actually people who were like, oh, look at this, this is what our students want. So with all of this, we just need to, I think we have to caution students on the whole idea of data, garbage in, garbage out, and that, you know, where, and you know, if we don't have good data, then we can't, I always tell my students, if we don't have the if, the then is irrelevant. So without the good randomized uh, data, then what can we really say about it? So do them, but with a, you know, that's, I guess, caveat mentor. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. So the idea that we were trying to, to go to get through today, we have just a, a few bit, and if you can stay on for just a minute, um, Kelly made something awesome that I want you guys to see. So don't, don't pop off just yet um, or hop off. Pop off and hop off are very different things, I think. Okay, so um, what we wanted to do is provide you different ways to um, look at your assessments and really look at what are you trying to get out of your students? What is your goal? You, we, yes, we'll have um, access to our presentation. Um, what is your goal with your students and does your assessment align with your goals? And there are ways to improve it. There's ways to improve. You wanna stay with exams and just wanna have better exam questions. If you wanna to try to get into more alternative types of assessments than just exams, doing things like activities, using data that students collect, using real data that you find online. And then of course, all the way to authentic assessments like the project that Kelly was, um, was offering. Um, so, and let's go to the next, the next slide. The reason that we're asking you to reconsider this is one of the things is we, one is you can engage students more when you do this kind of assessment. Um, I, I do find that my students, you know, in general, they're like, oh, you know, stats has a use and it can actually be interesting. And it's, I don't have students asking me, you know, what, when does anyone ever use this, which I doubt you get a lot of that either, but in, in stats, you do an algebra probably, but not in stats. And, but still it's like, these are, these types of assessments and using authenticity is much more engaging than just a traditional, let's do lecture, let's do problems, you know, and let's call it a day. There's much more um, that students will engage with. If you do things like this, it does reduce the opportunity to cheat. And I will even go one step further and say the desire because um, when, when something is relevant, it has a point and it has meaning to students' lives. So like Kelly's project, they get to choose. They, they have a lot of choice and a lot of agency in that project. So it's like they get to pick something they're interested in. 
that goes a long way with students not having as great a desire to cheat. I get that students cheat and they always will. I know that, but it does reduce it when it has some relevancy. And just to, to keep in mind something, I recently took a class, I took two classes this summer that related to my business and both of them had projects at the end of them. And when I saw both of them, I was like, oh, I don't want to do a project. But both of them, the projects were actually directly related to things that were going to help me with my business. So I did them because I had a point. None of it was like wasted time or just, you know, doing it to say we we're doing it. I literally have something I can take back to my team and there are things we're going to do with it. You will have students that engage more if there is relevance and there's a point to what we're doing. Um, and also we're trying to improve equity, reduce the equity gaps. Kelly brought this up earlier. When you go to assessments like this, we are getting away from some of those lower questions on Bloom's taxonomy. And so it is more difficult. My tests and what I expect of students are far more difficult than they were 15 years ago. But there are ways that you can you know, come up with, um, like what she was talking about, where we re let students reduce some things so that it doesn't have to be you know, overly punitive. There are, you know, students can still be um, successful in the course. Okay. So our final question, um, as we finish up this conversation, uh, what is something that you want your students to remember after your class? Like, this is usually my driving motivation. Like, what do I hope students take away from my class? It's okay if your answer is how to do a t-test, it's fine. Share in the chat. Let's hear from you. What do you want them to remember? <laughs> the, the chili peppers are gone. They were sexist, Todd. Do you not, did you not see that? You guys are great. I like that statistics is not objective. Like, I think that's huge. Oh, David, yes. yes. I really hope my students come out with that idea of being a critical consumer of data and statistics, especially Absolutely. how they are presented and in look the, at the details because someone's always trying to influence your, your take on things. And if you look at a course outline, there's like nothing on that course outline usually. Like I know our course outline doesn't even have that section on collecting data, like bias and like sample design, like that's not even on our course outline. It's all computational stuff. So, yes. All right, so um, with that, to me, um, this just starts the conversation. Uh, thinking about that overarching goal of what we want students to take away after the class leads me to think about backwards design. How do I design my entire course around getting students to understand all of these beautiful things that are in the chat right now? And how can I give them multiple opportunities to address that content and also show me their understanding of that content, that universal design for learning. Um, so I did already share, share that in the chat, but yes, thank you, Kathy. Um, I did give um, a link to a doc, a Google doc, where we can continue to share ideas. Uh, if there's another way that people want to share, this seems like an amazing group and I wanna leverage that. So if like a Slack channel or some other way to share makes more sense, I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, but I did want to, to give us a way to continue to share resources because Kathy and I are not the only experts in the room. I wouldn't even call myself an expert. Uh, I am a learner who is constantly reassessing what I am doing. Same. And so, I mean, I can't wait to go back and look at what Scott shared in the chat. I already put one of his links on projects in this document. Um, and then I also um, want to point out that I did these are all in that document, but they're also in the slides. Um, some resources, if you wanted to know more about any of these are in the slides, um, but yeah. And um, Shannon, um, if you could go into that document that we just shared and actually put the name of that book, because I think, I mean, that looks awesome. The um, seeing beyond the headlines, it looks really interesting. All right, and if there's any other questions, we got five minutes, Pat's back. I feel like I'm in trouble. No, no, just a quick comment, everyone. A reminder, um, we were already going to share the recording, the slides in the chat, but uh, Scott sent me his file for the CSI project. Uh, Kelly's going to send me um, 
other materials and, and a lot of these links in the chat uh, you'll have. So all, all the resources from today um, will, be, will be mailed out together. So that email should go out later tonight. And also know in the Google Doc, right, you can comment too. So if you want to use the comment feature to ask questions of something that's been posted or, you know, some practical considerations, you can you can always do that as well. And I think the, sh the link that I gave uh, Pat to share the slides is also set with commenting so that you can comment if you wanted some, some information from Kathy and I. I want to comment real quick on what Audrey said. Uh, yeah, I feel the same way. Like again, you'll I'll never I will never live long enough to use all the statistical activities I found, but that's what's so cool. That's why I love this class. It can, it's awesome for your students, but it can be awesome for you every semester. Just keep some of this and do, you know, incorporate what you can this fall and keep the rest for another semester. It's um, it doesn't all have to happen immediately. Yeah, and Kathy and I did really push to get this uh, before the fall semester so that hopefully yes. there will be the ability to like say, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to revise that test as we, I think uh, David said he was going to do, or I'm going to uh, incorporate some of these activities um, before the semester started. I will say this is all still like very much like point driven assessment. And uh, I saw Brenna Curley in the participants list and she did an amazing talk on standards based grading within a statistics course at US COTS. So um, I, that I've just, there's, there are so many places along this journey and um, I, I know that I'm not even all the way there. So go look at that talk. I'll put that in, I'll put that the link to all of their resources in the, the doc as well. Are there any other comments or questions for Kelly and Kathleen? If not, let's uh, give them a round of applause. Uh, I see it's already started in the chat, but um, Kelly and Kathleen, thank you for this great webinar. A lot of great ideas um, to, to quote one of the uh, presenters. Too much for uh, considering classes are starting next week, but a lot of good stuff to, to look on. So thank you all for doing this. Thank you for coming. It was Thank awesome, you. guys. All right. Uh, if there are no other questions, I believe that um, I know the thank yous are coming in fast and furious as they should, but did we miss any questions in there? I don't think so. Um, so thank you all for attending. Uh, be on the lookout for future webinars and the materials from today later this evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Kelly, Kathleen, well done. Well done. I don't feel like that. Um, Kelly, when you send when you send the slides or whatever, can we use, can you make a PDF that doesn't have the comments in them? Do you want me to just delete the comments? Sure. That'd be great. I don't really want them to see our silly notes that we have all the way through it. <laughs> I'm leaving shenanigans in there.